Bruce Springsteen once said that a release day was one day and an album was forever. As usual, I beg to differ with Mr Springsteen. I think albums define their time of release and become emblematic of those times. Just now we lost a man who made one such record for me. This is the Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to pay our respects to Adam Schlesinger. today of the sad passing of Adam Schlesinger who was one half of the songs of the wonderful and much missed around these parts leastways power pop legends Fountains of Wayne. Adam passed away from complications associated with the coronavirus. You can demonetize me see if I care. And while celebrity within a community engenders no greater loss than any other person succumbing to this accursed curse, it can have the sobering effect of making to a large group of people what hitherto fore seemed unreal seem very, very real. When the first Fountains of Wayne album came out, I was a new father of six months. So my oldest boy, Ike, will probably remember it amongst the first music he ever heard. And he heard it all through that summer of late 1996, early 1997. To me, it was one of the defining records of the 1990s, given that I'd largely switched off and become cynical about new music with the advent of grunge and the rise of samey sounding gangster rappers but along with Odelay by Beck and Different Class by Pulp and Jeff Buckley's Grace and the first Ben Folds 5 album, it was in that first Fountains of Wayne album that I felt a wave of joy and invention and pride itself coming back to the fringes of the music, replacing those cookie-cutter grunge or hip-hop sounds and compensating for the complete disintegration of pop music. Fountains of Wayne especially I could relate to because of the guitars. The big, shiny, spangly guitars. There was more to it than that. In the new music as a whole, and that included Fountains of Wayne, there was a dichotomous reverence for the music that had gone before them, but also a sprightly irreverence. Fountains of Wayne owed and acknowledged debts to Big Star and the Kinks and Cheap Trick and ABBA, but they also owned those influences in an almost irony-free, completely postmodern and non-cynical frame. The exception to that statement amongst their peers, of course, is Beck, being the imperious scamp that he is, who magpied his way through generations, threw them in a musical smoothie maker, consulted the rhyming Beckchenary here and there, and... No, no, the rhyming Beckchenary! ...did so with utter, winking, uproarious irony. The division of work in Fountains of Wayne was always kind of obvious. Collingwood with his ear for melody and his eye for sharp, lyrical detail, Schlesinger with his nose for a hook and his capacity to write the brilliant next step hyperspace choruses, and it worked wonderfully well for five albums and a really good double album assortment of odds and ends. So let's take a look at those albums. 1996 gave us the self-titled debut, which in short was 12 songs, 11 of which were absolute gems. The most Lustrous of those gems are Radiation Vibes, Sick Day, Joe Ray, She's Got a Problem and Please Don't Rock Me Tonight. And the Yellow Submarine on the album is The Notorious Leave the Biker, which is too twee and cutesy for its own good. A sin they would relapse into from time to time. I bought this album because I read a review in either Q or Mojo. I'd bought Odelay a few months before for the same reason, and in its 
brashness, ebullience and guitar gasmic ecstasies. It reached back to what I carry at my musical core, that love of old school glam rock stompers. I always hate to say that a debut is a band's best album. It's hard to separate the shock of the new from the value of measured progression and there's always the implication that one is saying that it's been all downhill since a good beginning. But for me, Fountains of Wayne just edges it as their best album, simply for its joy, for its having acted as the antidote for me to grunge, and for being that soundtrack to new fatherhood. In 1999, Utopia Parkway appeared. More self-consciously 80s teenage boy on a spree theme. It's kind of like a version of Born to Run, where the objective is not the vast dark vistas of the unknown or the perils of the big city to which our heroes are fleeing, but the well-lit familiarity of ritual, the cloying and safe comforts of the shopping malls, beaches or conservative neighbourhoods, and the celebration of the accomplishment of the known, not the challenge of the unknown. The songs ratchet up the tunefulness and the production is breezier and brighter. But the album falls to the other of Fountains of Wayne's principal vices, it's overlong by at least two songs. Go Hippie could immediately be cut and probably prom theme as well. Denise, the uniquely annoying lead single, was a calculated attempt by the band to write the stupidest possible song they could. It's pretty stupid and could possibly go too. The highlights include Trouble Times, which is the reason that songs have choruses. Hat and Feet, the killer pal pop trio of the title track, Lost in Space and It Must Be Summer, and Poignant, A Fine Day for a Parade. At its best, the sheer craft of the songs like Trouble Time surpasses the songs on the debut, and It Must Be Summer at least matches the rock out factor. But a few too many songs, including Fan Fave, Red Dragon, Tattoo, veer towards trite or clever for the sake of being clever. 2003's Welcome Interstate Managers takes everything that was best and everything that's worse about the previous album and magnifies it. The first five songs, the quirky Mexican wine, storming bright future in sales, hit single Stacy's Mom, the sweet hack and sack, which Katy Perry did a surprisingly good cover of, and the jangle tacular No Better Place get the album off to a thumping start. But the problems kick in thereafter. Little Red Light can't seem to contain all of its hooks and the song sounds a little disjointed. Hey Julie is a song that everybody seems to love but it just gives me a toothache. And the stream of good but not great songs after that, including Peace and Love, which is possibly the worst song they ever did, and Fire Island, which sounds like they secretly want to be the Ben Folds 5, see the album overstaying its welcome by a dozen or so minutes. All that said, there's so much to enjoy here and so much to be thankful for. It makes it impossible to dislike this record, and given the band turned up at the studio with no songs, no fixed lineup, no record deal, no producer, and paid for everything themselves, the sheer moxie behind it makes it feel triumphant. 2007 brought us Traffic and Weather, a difficult album, as the boys weren't getting on so well by this point and one that doesn't always meet its potential, even if it does stick doggedly to its vague theme. However, you wouldn't tell this from the absolutely brilliant Beatles meets Disco meets Stacy's Mom opener, Someone to Love, one of the best songs they ever laid down. The next track, 92 Subaru, on the other hand, neatly summarises the problems that seem to pop up across the album. The song seems like it was written in sections, and the sections don't quite fit together especially on what should be the big killer dilla hook at the end of the chorus. The next track, Yolanda Hayes, is a delight, but again, the vocal phrasing and the melody in the chorus just don't mesh. We then endure a long stretch of four songs that don't catch the attention before Michael and Heather at the baggage claim, which relies on its virtues of melody and minute observation, rescues us from a stretch of tedium, the rest of the album is unexceptional, Planet of Weed especially being utterly pointless, until the close of the charming and tuneful seatbacks and tray tables, which again shows us the way forward to the coming album. All in all, it's a frustrating record. Two or three genuinely great songs, 
three or more that are either underwritten or overproduced, at least one song too many, and Planet of Weed would be that song, and a clutch of songs which are neither here nor there. Not bad by any stretch, but a definite dip. The final album, Sky Full of Holes, arrived in 2011. Great bands should leave with great albums, and Fountains of Wayne came darn close here. The songs are every bit as tuneful, every bit as quirky as their best work, but they seem somehow more human here. Fountains of Wayne were always at their best when they sang about real people and not urban, suburban tropes. Again, their first six songs are all immaculate little character or situational sketches. A dip in the ocean is complemented by as sweet a melody as they've ever written. Even the traditional mid-album lull is brief and it must be said incredibly tuneful. Cold Comfort Flowers and Working Man Hands are songs which would have been highlights on traffic and weather. As much as I put little stock in lyrics or the themes they try to project and that it's a stretch to get the dates to line up, a lot of this album could be interpreted as being songs about the imminent failure of Schlesinger's marriage. The Summer Place, Radio Bar, Hate to See You Like This, which is an outlier in the Fountains of Wayne catalogue for its sheer emotional rawness, hidden behind a veil of modern plentitudes, and the Firelight Waltz lend some credence to the theory. An excellent album, and a fitting end of certainly my favourite band of the new millennium. I was terribly sad when I heard that Schlesinger was gone. Singers come and go, but I'll say this. If you love and value the music and the principles on which classic guitar pop were built, you and I lost a good friend when Adam Schlesinger left us. I'll admit I've been flippant about this coronavirus thing, and I have at times let my objectivist pragmatism run away with me. But I shouldn't be, and, and nor should you. Look after yourself. Look after your families and look after your communities. Sit tight until these dread times are gone. And until we meet again in good company or until the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down. You keep listening to the good stuff. You stay righteous. And you stay safe.